Praise the Lord. I'm so very thankful that you are able to join us this morning for our community Bible Church Sunday morning service. Let's pray. Let's ask God to give us his help this morning. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you for your kindness, for your goodness. Lord, you are such a good God. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to every heart. Lord, by the power of the Holy Ghost, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, give us your help this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing a couple of songs. The first one, Living by Faith. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know will have or everything, and all of my worries.
faith. What a way to live. Praise the Lord. It's not the easiest way, but it is by far the most rewarding way because God always takes care of us. When we step out in faith, God never fails to take care of us. Praise the Lord. One more song. Let's sing No Tears in Heaven. No Tears in Heaven. Praise God. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness, when we shall join the happy place that's promised to us for eternity. Glory to God, and I'm thankful for that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Well, today is Palm Sunday, and I want to preach to you about Palm Sunday. Praise the Lord. It, uh, my message is, who is this humble king? Who is this humble king? Matthew 21, verses 9, 10, and 11. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Who is this humble king? Dear Lord, Lord, we need you this morning in this message. Speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to realize that you are our king, O oh God. You are the one who rules over us. You're the humble king, Lord. 
minister in this message this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. The ancient prophecy was that of the Messiah who would be the humble king. It's in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Who ever heard of a mild, gentle, meek, kind king? I mean, I mean, humble and lowly are not the normal adjectives to describe the word king. Now, the opposite of the Greek for humble means, you're going to love this, hard to deal with, difficult, troublesome, irksome, angry, cruel, savage, harsh, severe, stern, strict, ferocious, ill-tempered, angry, testy. Now, those, those would seem to be a much more accurate description of a king. But this morning we're going to read about the humble king. The, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday is one of the very few events in the life of our Lord that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. It's recorded in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and in John. So, what I want to do, I have five points. I'm going to start with John, and then we'll go to Matthew, then to Mark, then to Luke, and then back to John again. And all four of the Gospel writers seem to have an extra little detail to put into this story. So let's start in John. To the Jewish leaders, Jesus caused a crisis of influence. John 12, 9 through 13. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Sometimes certain events seem to take a life of their own. And this is apparently what happened when Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. It was apparently such a hot issue that the three synoptic writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, could not address it for Lazarus' sake. The Pharisees were determined to kill Lazarus, and only, only decades later could John give the details of that amazing story. In chapter 11 of John, he tells us that many of the Jews believed on Jesus because of Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life. And they believed it caused such 
fear and consternation both among the Pharisees and the chief priests, which was made up of Sadducees, that they felt they had no recourse but to put Jesus to death. Caiaphas, the chief priest, proclaimed that one would have to die to save the rest of the nation. This was such a threat to Jesus. I mean, they were trying to kill him. And it was such a threat to Jesus that he was no longer able to walk in public, but instead he had to hide himself. And the celebrity status of Jesus and Lazarus became so great because of the miracle that the chief priests felt they had to execute Lazarus also. The fears of the Jewish leaders were realized when a huge crowd of people began celebrating the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. They waved palm branches just like was done when Judas Maccabeus rededicated the altar in B.C. 164. They were proclaiming Jesus to be Messiah and King of the Jews. And for the Jewish leaders, this was horrible. For those that were celebrating Jesus, this was the entry of their deliverer and the beginning again of Jewish dominion. Someone who could bring the dead back to life must surely be God's anointed deliverer. That's what they thought. So let's go to Matthew Chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. The ancient prophecy is fulfilled. <clears throat> and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway, you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. I translated that, verse 5, Matthew 21 and verse 5. Here's the Randy's translation of verse 5. Tell the daughter of Zion, Look! Your gentle king is coming to you, mounted upon a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a working animal. <clears throat> there was a prophecy in, that we read in Zechariah 9 and 9 that was unmistakably <clears throat> referring to the Messiah. And if there was ever a proof that the Messiah had indeed come, this event that, that Zechariah prophesied, the Messiah coming into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, that event would be the undeniable evidence. And Jesus sent, <coughs> pardon me, his disciples to gather the materials that would fulfill this sign. And the prophecy was very specific. The entry would be made into Zion or Jerusalem. 
The king would be lowly and gentle. <coughs> His mount would be a donkey, but not just any donkey. It would be a young donkey colt that no one had ever ridden on before. And the fulfillment of this prophecy was going to happen in exact detail. Let's go to Mark. This was a divine appointment. Mark 11, 4 through 8. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. And they loose him, and certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye, loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded. And they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him, and many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strawed them in the way. Though Jesus had apparently never been to where that colt was tied, the disciples found it just like Jesus had described. The disciples came and took the colt, just as the Lord had instructed them. And when their right to take it was questioned, the answer Jesus wanted them to give was exactly the satisfaction needed for the disciples to take that colt as Jesus wanted. And the rest of the events that happened were entirely unscripted. The plan of God, prophesied hundreds of years earlier, was happening just as it was supposed to happen. Now, King Jesus is different from all other kings. Look in this picture that we have. His followers are wholly unarmed and without military plans or requirements. They have not spears but palm branches. They have not trumpets but simply the voice of psalms. Their leader is not mounted upon the proud horse, which was Incidentally, an animal forbidden to Israel on account of its warlike character, but he was mounted upon a donkey. And in all of this, the Roman government is not in the least disturbed. A week later, almost a little bit, it was less than a week, but five days later when Jesus is brought before Pilate, Pilate, who was a jealous man, doesn't even know about the joyous procession where they're crying, Hosanna, blessed is the king of the Jews. And Pilate doesn't even know anything about that. When Jesus is subsequently brought before him, before Pilate, him and Pilate are utter strangers. Jesus is a king to be worshipped. Luke 19, verses 37 through 40. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you, 
that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus was and is the Messiah, the Anointed One from God. Jesus is the King of all creation. And for the moment, the crowd got it right. They got it right in how they were supposed to view Jesus the Messiah. They rejoiced and praised God for the mighty works that he had done for them. Jesus is indeed the King who comes in the name of the Lord. How should one view Jesus? Who is the real Jesus? Jesus is the humble king. Our world of prideful leadership, of selfish ambition, has little or no understanding of the truly humble king. He's the kind king. A hallmark of our Lord is his kindness and compassion. And Jesus truly cares about you. He is the merciful and gracious king. He forgives transgressions and removes them from us, leaving us with an unearned righteousness that pleases God. Jesus is worthy of our worship. Hallelujah. Uh, Sister Betty Withrow used to tell us all the time that, that if we don't worship, the rocks will cry out. And she always said, I don't want any rock getting my blessing. Oh, Jesus is worthy of our worship. I'm telling you, if we don't worship, something will. Let the worshipers be us. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Praise your name. Praise your name. There's no one more worthy of our worship. Making the circle all the way back to John, Jesus is the King who gives life. John, uh, John 12, verses 16 through 19. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they, that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record, for this cause the people also met him, for they for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. The miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead seemed to be one of those miraculous things that only a Messiah could accomplish. Who wouldn't want a Messiah that could raise one from the dead if something bad happened? But they had to understand that Jesus was much more than that. Jesus was the one and is the one who gives life eternal life. Jesus was about to die so that we could have life. 
But nobody at this event, the triumphal entry, nobody here at this event could see that coming. The crowd proclaimed Jesus to be king. But that would be the foundation of the accusation against him just a few days later. As a matter of fact, Pilate would write in the accusation over his head, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. All of this was in the plan of God for the salvation of the world. Jesus would die on a cross to give the world eternal life. And the world needs to know that Jesus is truly King. King of the world. Jesus can save anyone that will come to Him. In conclusion, we started out with Matthew 21, verses 9 through 11. Let me read that one more time. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So I'm asking you the question, Who is this humble king? It's Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. How well do you know Jesus? If he's not your king, he wants to be. And he wants to be your king in a very personal way. And you get to choose whether or not to let him be that for you. Will you let him be your king and savior today? In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How do you make Jesus your king? Confess Jesus as your Savior. Jesus, you're my Savior. I accept you as my Savior. Confess your sins, it says in this. Oh, Lord, so sorry for my sins. I confess that I'm responsible for them. And would you forgive me? Believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. And in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you do that? You just have to call on Him. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will meet you where, you're, where you are and you will be saved. You'll know the difference. You'll feel the difference. God will make you a new creation in Jesus. It's Palm Sunday. Let's worship Jesus as King. Hallelujah. He is my King. Praise the Lord. I hope you have a wonderful Palm Sunday. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, 
Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that I have you. I know that you are mine. You are my king. Oh God, if there's one that doesn't know you as their savior, I pray, Lord, that, that they would take that step of faith and confess their sins to you and accept your presence into their heart. Lord, you're more than ready to forgive. Lord, go with each one of us. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, let us worship you. Draw our hearts into worship this Palm Sunday today. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you this morning.